Here's your chance to start the new year the right way. Now available, the official Ditto 1991 t-shirt, just $12.50, or the Ditto 1991 sweatshirt, only $19.95. Order yours today. We've enclosed a convenient order form with this video. Send it along with your order to the Excellence in Marketing Group, P.O. Box 214188, Sacramento, California, 95821. Please allow four to six weeks for delivery. <laughs> I have got, I have a frog in my throat that's about dry. Have you ever had to speak and you clear your throat every five words you say? That's how I feel today. I'm good. Maybe I should, uh, maybe I should do a voice exercise or something loosened up. Anyway, greetings to you conversationalists all across the Fruited Plain and welcome to the award-winning, thrill-packed, ever-exciting, increasingly popular, growing by leaps and bounds Rush Limbaugh program here on the Excellence in Broadcasting Network. We will have on today's program, by the way, we'd like to welcome back for today's show Mervyn Snurdly. Merv in for the day. Mario Snurdly. I have no idea why or where Mario Snurdly went why he's not here. We will have on today's show a feminist update. We have an environmental update. We have animal rights news. Animal rights news in addition to the fact that it has just been discovered that 536 trillion cockroaches live in New York City. With talent, so much talent, more than I'll ever need. On loan from God, Rush Limbaugh. Here on the Excellence in Broadcasting Network. Ladies and gentlemen, the Rush Limbaugh neutron bomb vaporizes liberals, leaves conservatives standing. So nice to see you. incredible event folks this is the absolute and it really should be no surprise this is the largest crowd in the history of the rush to excellence tour thank you I love you God was watching the Joan Rivers show he then placed a phone call to a reporter for the New York Times Hi, this is God. I'm watching the Joan Rivers show and you people are an embarrassment. I have created much that's great and much that's wonderful in the universe and I thought you were part of it, but no, you've botched it. This human race is a failure and I'm ending the world tomorrow. And the guy at the New York Times says, no, no, no. You can't, you can't. We just now got Gorbachev. He can save the world, he can do it all. Gorbachev, Shmorbachev says, God, you've blown it and I can't stand the embarrassment any longer. New York Times guy says, well, can I have an exclusive? No, I'm calling the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and USA Today. Well, New York Times guy says not too bad. He hangs up, he makes the phone calls. The papers start working on their final editions. Two days later, they come out. New York Times banner headline, God says world to end tomorrow. News and analysis page D11.
Wall Street Journal. God says world to end tomorrow, market to close early. <laughs> USA Today banner headline, we're gone. Washington Post, God says world to end tomorrow, women and minorities hardest hit. <laughs> you know, I have, uh, I, <laughs> you know, ladies and gentlemen, ever since the uh, Pat Sajak show, I uh, am very much concerned who shows up at these. And backstage, I asked some people to go out and scope out the crowd, see who's here. They came back. They said, looks like a pretty clean bunch. I said, oh, it means Earth First won't be here tonight then. <laughs> yes. Chico, last night, a uh, couple of Earth... Thank you. I think this... People here from Chico? Oh, by the way, by the way, speaking of suburbs, the... the people of Rio Linda deserve an A for effort, but... I drove out there today. It's worse than reported. You know, I mean, to finally get the gumption, guts, courage, what have you, to clean up the neighborhood. Does everybody just put your stuff out in front of your house and we'll come pick it up. So much stuff, it's impossible to pick it up. They're going to have to build a new landfill. They're going to need a new barge. And I, see, they were trying to do it because they knew I was coming. It was all tried to the time to impress me. So it's an A for an effort, but as typical in Rio Linda, failure in execution. An F. Do you know it would be very tough to do the homeless Olympics out there now? But it's still something like the dumpster dig would be easy, but the... the uh, 10,000 meter shopping cart relay would be questionable. Going through some of the questions, you people have become more courageous and brave. Some, you wouldn't believe the number of questions. When are you going to run for office? And I, I can't tell you how many people want to know what did I do with Sidney Biddle Barrows? Oh, see? Sidney Biddle Barrows is, I mean, my friends, I'm very naive. Oh. 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 I am totally not. Well, all right. do you know, let me give you a couple of examples. Normally by this time, condoms have been thrown on the stage. <laughs> Hasn't happened tonight. Usually does. The last time it happened, there were two condoms. I'd never heard of either. Well, I'd heard of one. But the other one I'd never heard of, and both of them surprised me. The first one was a glow worm condom. <laughs> now, and it's green, it's the color of the, you know, the hands on your watch. Shines in the dark. <laughs> now, my first reaction is, again, based on my naivete, is who's gonna see it? <laughs> and and if somebody does, where is it? <laughs> uh, and if you need to see it, then what do you think you're really doing? <laughs> the flavored condom. Now that one really troubled me. The flavored condom, the flavored condom uh, I first heard about when they tested it in Florida. The guy who's in charge of approving requisitions, state money, had a requisition across his desk, $39 for, for three condoms, flavored condoms. And somebody threw one at me, a strawberry. Yeah, it was strawberry. Now, I looked at, I looked at that, it's flavored condoms. 
because I didn't know, I, I didn't know they had taste buds there. And, <laughs> well, why else? I love to take the occasion of these appearances to see to it that I am not misunderstood. Don't want to be misunderstood. I do not revel in being a mystery to people. And I believe the things I say, most of them, and I'm very in intent on having you know when I'm serious so that you'll know. And a, a occasion like this performance makes it easier for me to go into great detail about certain things that I happen to believe. I happen to... Oh, wow. here can't see it. There's a giant screen up there. This is going to be superb. <laughs> Times must really be tough for Luke and Bill. It's hot as hell. <laughs> Just kidding. Now, the first thing I want to do is try to explain to you people that I do not hate animals. I don't hate them. I want to explain. No. I want to explain why they don't have rights. But first, I want to tell you a couple of little animal stories. I love animal stories. Have you ever heard of frog licking? And by the way, by the way, by the way, my friends, I want to tell you also at the outset of this broadcast and program tonight, I don't make things up. Nothing is made up, and I will on occasion tonight speak bluntly, and many of you will squirm in your seats. And you'll say, I thought we were going to come here and hear virtue and morality and so forth. And the guy's telling me about this. It all pays off. It all pays off. Got to push the envelope, which we will. Now, frog licking. Frog licking. Have you heard of it? I was the one who first discovered this. Now, you people out there, you have busy lives. You're out there earning your living, trying to keep your kids not on drugs. Keep your kids from becoming pregnant. You're trying to save money for their education. You're trying to do all the right things. So you read the paper and it says, frog licking has become a major activity in Colorado. Oh, look at this table. Look at frogs out in Colorado. And that's all you do and you move on to the next story. I am still amazed when I read things like that. How, how does it get started? It has to be this way. You have to have an environmentalist in the woods communing with nature uh, probably, probably, uh, you know, running around going, oh, 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 and looking at the trees and saying, hi, Greg, and going to hug the tree, oh, I am one with the tree, oh, I care about nature, <laughs> and they're communing with it, and they got a little boy scout, little green socks on, little green shorts, a backpack with a lot of wheat nut mix in there. <laughs> and Sony Walkman, listening to Madonna music, Don't Bungle the Jungle album. <laughs> well, speaking of bungling the jungle, look at this. The, uh, <laughs> Rush Screws the Rainforest. <laughs> Does anybody have a camera? I know they didn't let them in, but one of the, one of you people had to sneak one in here. <laughs> what? Ah, sir, could you come up here? Could you come up here? Please, would you come up here? Would you please come up here? Let's talk about this. Please, come up here. This is... I want to kneel down and have you photograph me. Thank you. 
We'll make a picture out of that, put an extra brochure, Rush Limbaugh expresses love for the rainforest. I wonder how many species died because we have those here tonight. Oh well, can't be concerned about it. They're dead now anyway. Now, this little environmentalist, little environmentalist, many of you probably thought I was going to lose my place. I never lose my place. Environmentalist is skipping through the woods and stops upon spying a frog. Oh, look at that frog. I think I'll pick it up and lick it. So, leans down, picks up the frog. The greatest tradition. The microphone just had an orgasm. I learned to do that by listening to Barney Frank. Now, back. So anyway, back to the frog. See, if you lick the Colorado spotted toad, it secretes a substance, that, it's a hallucinogen. And you, you get a drug effect, you get turned on. So you pick up the frog, you lick it. Now, how many of you in this room think of the situation I've just described? Or think of yourself in your backyard? How many of you would ever be inclined to pick up a frog and touch it anywhere with your mouth? Much less lick it. Who would do it? Then, after you do it, then you've got to tell somebody else you did it. And you have to invite them to do it with you. And then they do. Now, who are we talking about? I don't know, but they certainly aren't normal. The word then has to get, how would anybody know frog licking takes place? And where are the animal rights people on this? Is that not a violation of the frog's rights to be licked by some environmentalist with lice in his hair? Now, there is another story major relevance to issues happening in our country today. As you know, my friends, the sea turtle is an endangered species. Why? Because evil shrimpers happen to nab a couple of them every now and then while murdering zillions of shrimp. You ever wonder all these people worried about flipper, flipper, wilder than lightning? You get maybe two dolphin die with every one million tuna and nobody is expressing any concern for the tuna. <laughs> Poor tuna. Nobody's saying it. Now, sea turtles also suffer strangulation death because helium-filled balloons eventually come back down to Earth. They land on the ocean, and sea turtles think they are food. Little fishes, they go up there <laughs> and choke and they die. And so they're dying at fast rates. They've been proclaimed a protected species. A guy in Florida was caught stealing. I would have said poaching, but there are some people here from Leo, Rio Linda, no doubt. <clears throat> Who would have thought we were talking about eggs? <laughs> I'm sorry, I just can't resist it. I love you people in Rio Linda, but gee, there's no others like you. Now. Guy steals a bunch of sea turtle eggs and gets called into court. Female judge. Sir, I find you guilty of stealing sea turtle eggs. You've been fined $106,000. He said, wait a minute. These are not sea turtles. These are sea turtle eggs. And there's no law that says I can't steal them. Sir, they're going to be sea turtles. But they're not sea turtles now. Don't care. They're going to be guilty. $106,000 fine. True story. It gives rise to the question, when does life begin? At conception or when you get laid? 
I know many of you conservatives, my gosh, what's he talking about? My friends, there is a culture war that is going on in the country. The situation in America was, you want your freedom? Fine, do whatever you want to do. Keep it to yourself. That was the implied agreement in America. And that implied agreement gave us a mainstream, or, or what some people might call a, uh, <clears throat> an establishment, like Nixon called it, and then a bunch of subcultures. And the subcultures were subcultures because they were not normal in the way standard normalcy is defined. They were kooks, and they still are. Kooks, oddballs, weirdos, just unable to fit in. You can take any group of people, high school, senior class, high school class of any age, you're going to have your big cliques, you're going to have people who don't fit into it, you're going to have your nerds, your oddballs, and your weirdos. A nation is no different. The group's just larger, more people. These people don't fit in. <clears throat> and up till now, they've been content to gather among themselves and to just live in their little groups and enjoy life as they can, but they've always felt troubled being subculture or minority or in the outcast groups. Now they're tired of being subcultures, and there's a war going on as to who is going to define the limits that we place on our society. Let me tell you, this is a good point to tell you how we differ from animals. When people start talking about animal rights, words are crucial. What are rights? <clears throat> this culture war illustrates precisely what's going on. We in America today are in the midst, it's an exciting time to be alive. We're in the midst of a redefinition of who is going to define right and wrong and what the punishment is going to be for those who violate the limits that we place on our behavior. We're arguing about who has the right to tell us what's right and wrong. We're arguing over what censorship is and to me, it's pretty scary. It is absolutely pretty scary. I mean, we have people who are defending the right of two live crew to record songs that talk about busting female vaginal walls, and the Now Gang's not upset over that. They're worried about some diminutive 50-year-old guy who's never been married and what he thinks about abortion, whose name is Souter, maybe on the Supreme Court. And oh, I want to tell you something about that. <laughs> Never been married, keep that in mind. <laughs> Story in the paper the other day quoted a, a high-ranking Democrat, whose name I can't remember, who said about the confirmation process of Judge Souter, it'll be interesting to see what we find when he comes out of the closet. <laughs> oh. They're going to do that, are they? I would submit, my friends, that any of us would be safer in a closet with Judge Souter than any of us in an automobile with Ted Kennedy. But, <clears throat> nevertheless, it, it strikes me as strange that one man who we don't know anything about. Stop and think it's an advantage to go to Washington and nobody knows what you are. That's how bad it's gotten. When Bork got there, you know the problem with Bork is that paper trail's too big. He's done too much writing. He's not of the proper judicial temperament. Now here comes a guy that we don't even know what he thinks. That's not good. We can't find out if he's bad. <laughs> In the meantime, we have people defending two live crew defending Robert Maplethorpe, defending Andres Serrano, who are afraid that, say, posting the Ten Commandments in school, not enforcing the fact, stop, what is wrong with the Ten Commandments? Nothing in the world is wrong with them. You, the list, take the religion out of it. I know this is not a religious comment. Just take the religion, thou shalt not kill. Oh, boy, that'll really put a nation in trouble. <laughs> thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Oh, we can't have that. Where would Ted Kennedy be? Thou shalt not steal. Oh, gee, we can't have that. How could Jim Wright have prospered the way he did? I mean, take the, why is it 
that just because something happens to have a religious connotation, it poses a great threat to America. But let two live crew write and sing that garbage. And the pointy-headed academics and the arts and croissant crowd, it is an important work because it deals with the evolution of the musical state of art in America today. Sad. In my office, 17th floor EIB building, you can look out the window on occasion and see a homeless person drop his pants and defecate. Oh, see, and it hasn't even, I mean, it gets worse, but just, it pays off. Now, when you see this, people in New York just go walking by, <laughs> or they walk by and don't pay any attention at all, don't notice it at all, don't want to. I spy this, hypothetical begins. I go to Dunkin' Donuts, grab a box, put on some latex gloves, take the elevator down, go to the corner, scoop it up, put it in the box, take it back upstairs, shape it and form it. Now, 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 please, God, why did we come here? I then grab a candle, lavender candle, and I stick it in the middle of it. <laughs> I then get on a Trump shuttle because he's in trouble and head to Washington to the Corcoran Gallery. I walk into the Corcoran Gallery and I'm met by your typical pointy head arts and croissant administrator. Liberal speaking, well, sir. Thank you for, 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 you know, they stutter and they do, uh, uh, thank, thank you for, 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 uh, coming to the, the Cor Corcoran Gallery. I, I say, what, what, what have you brought for us here? Hi, my name's Rush Limbaugh. I'm the best talk show host in the world, but I want to branch out. I want to become an artist. I want to be a person of substance, and I have worked on this piece for a long time, at least 10 minutes. I don't have the money to rent space on your wall here for this, but I know you get government grants. And I want to apply so that you will expose my work of art. Well, we hit it the Corcoran are always, always interested in supporting the art, in supporting those who are trying to break into the art community. What, 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 what is it? So I open the box. Oh my God! Yeah, why, why, why? That 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 look, look, looks like a pile of crap. <laughs> you are calling my work of art a pile of crap? Well, what would you call it, Zach? It looks like a pile of crap with a candle in it of all things. How in the world do you dare bring such stuff to the Cochrane? I am embarrassed to have to tell you that this is art, say I. This is New York City. That's the Empire State Building. You see, this crap is 25% all the way to the top. This is what the homeless have to live through in New York City because of the Reagan administration. Isn't that how you do it? Criticize Reagan, it's art. This is what the Reagan administration did because of budget cuts. And next year, it's going to be halfway up. I don't think that you would have the temerity to bring such a distinguished hall as the Cochrane a box of crap and dare call it art. Get it out! Get it out! I get depressed and I leave. <laughs> and as I'm walking out, here comes Andre Serrano. He comes walking in. Well, Mr. Serrano. Mrs. Rado, I say you arrived with yet another glorious work for us, have you not? Yeah? Yeah? You want to take a look at it? Certainly, certainly. What, 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 what have you for, for, for us here? Well, this is a picture of Christ submerged in a vat of my own urine. Oh, Mr. Mr. Serrano, this is 
Why, this is one of the most expressive pieces I've ever seen. Look at the shading there. That's absolutely wonderful. We'll be glad to hang that on the wall and meet. And they did. They did, and that was called art. And I submit to you that there's no difference between my box of crap and that picture. But one of them was called art. Why? Because an artist did it. Now, neither of those two things is art. You know why in my... Now, I am not, my friends, some holier-than-thou intellectual who understands how in the world to be expressive in talking about art and defining its great distinctions. All I know is that art should be evocative, not provocative. It's the same thing with my radio show. A lot of people say, boy, I just love it when you make those people mad, get them all fired up. That's not what I'm trying to do. That doesn't take any talent, which I have in abundance on loan from God. <laughs> no, all you have to do to make people mad is tell them what you think. Statistically, half of them are going to disagree with you. Then if you embellish it with bravado, arrogance, confidence, then they hate you. <laughs> Art should be evocative. It's easy to offend. That was not art, that picture of Christ submerged in urine. That was desecration. The word exists, and it's very descriptive. You compare that. I have one of the, one of the most profound experiences in my life was a tour of St. Peter's Basilica, the Sistine Chapel. I'm not Catholic, but to look at some of the works of art, and they really are, because has there been another Michelangelo? There hasn't. Not very many people could do what he did. Anybody could submit what Serrano did. It ought to have uniqueness to it. It ought to have beauty to it. It ought to be evocative. It ought to be mind-expanding. It ought not be necessarily offensive. That's just another example of the culture war. Now, I think people are fighting back. People are not just sitting around taking this stuff. I'm encouraged by the signs that I see out there because I have such a great opportunity to talk to the people. Now, <clears throat> I also, my friends, would like to take a moment and to ask you to join me in a period of memoriam for one of our, our fine late activists by the name of Mitch Snyder. <laughs> Mitch assumed room temperature recently Mitch, Mitch committed suicide and then left instructions that his body be cremated, which it was, and about which now it can be said, Mitch has finally earned a home. <laughs> Homeless update time. Ooh, ain't got no home. I take the job. I know blade is wrong. I take the job. Ain't got no home. I know blade is wrong. Hey, stop the tape, man. Stop the tape. I just thought of something. Stop and think of this a minute. Clarence Frogman Henry sings the homeless update theme. He ain't got no. Oh, that reminds me. Mitch Snyder's mom called. No, Mitch Snyder's sister called and said, Mitch Schneider's mom is in tears because of what I'm doing. And I don't know if it's true or not. I'll tell you about that in a minute. I'm getting sidetracked, but I, because of my fertile brain, never lose my place. Thank you. Yes, my friends, imagine Clarence Frogman Henry who sings, not yet, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you when I want the music to start. Do you want the music now, right? I'll tell you when it's time for the music. Here's Clarence Frogman Henry singing Ain't Got No Home. Clarence Frogman Henry calls my answering machine and says, I'll take the job. What If we could get that tape, just that, I'll take the job, and, and edit it in the homeless theme, can you imagine the irony of the message? Ain't got no home, I'll take the job. Nowhere to roam, I'll take the job. 
I mean, the message to cure homelessness within the theme. I'm a lonely boy. I take the job. I ain't got a home. I take the job. I got a voice. I take the job. I love to sing. Homeless I people. Sing like a girl. Want to solve your problem? Listen to this. And I sing like a frog. I take the job. I'm a lonely boy. I take the job. I ain't got a home. I take the job. Ooh. All right, time to clarify a point of confusion yesterday on the homeless update. Now, I told you people yesterday the Democratic National Convention will be held here in New York in 1992. I also told you, and quite properly so, and do not forget, this is expert political analysis and one of the many reasons you are fortunate to have me as your host. The Democratic Party, my friends, owe any elected Democratic official owes his or her success to acceptance and votes from a whole bunch of little constituencies. Ah, some are bigger than others, but, but they're, a, they're a varied group. For example, Ann Richards, I don't lie, who's running for governor of Texas, was named an honorary lesbian last weekend. She had to accept the honor because if she would have refused it, she would have angered not only the lesbians, but the now gang and might have run the risk of not getting their votes. <laughs> Can't have that. Well, same thing with General David Dinkins, mayor of New York. Now, he said, he said that during the Democratic National Convention, the homeless will not be swept off the streets just to sanitize the city. If there are homeless people in New York, they're going to be on the streets so the people of America can see it. And it's the homeless advocacy in New York demanding that of him. So there you have it, folks. I mean, there's a, and, and this point was disputed yesterday, and this is not an incorrect point. It's a flawless point. The mayor of New York is being told by one of his constituency groups, the homeless advocacy, you better not sweep those homeless off the streets. We want America to see those homeless. Why? Want to blame the Reagan administration. Want to blame the Republicans for those homeless. Don't solve the homeless problem. Don't get them. It, it's, they're far better off off the streets any time rather than on the streets, but to put them out there and to exploit them, to make of them a spectacle, just to get... If that doesn't tell you what I've been saying all along, what more do you need? I ain't got a mother. I take the job. I ain't got a border. I take the job. I ain't got a brother. I take the job. Not even a brother. I take the job. I'm an only bro. I ain't got no... I take the job. This is the Excellence in Broadcasting Network. Now, my friends, I would like you to join me in memoriam as we sing, as I sing a requiem mass for Mitch. Are you ready? May I have silence, may we have respect. Do you cheer in church, please? Ain't God no home? Ooh, ooh. Like a girl, and I sing like a frog. 
I'm a lonely boy. I ain't got a home. Oh, oh, oh. You composed a song for me? Yep. Want to do it? You want to hear it? Yeah. It's, it's what we call the Rush Limbo song. The Rush Limbo song. I take the job. Here we job. go. I take the job. All right. I take the job. I take the job. Are you with me? Are you with me? Woo. One more time. Rush Limbo, 
That is more fun than a human being should be allowed to have. Now, you know what we're going to do? We're going to submit this to MTV. <laughs> Can you? They probably won't take it, but you know, we're videotaping a lot of this for the next Rush to Excellence video. And when this section comes up, you know, out of MTV and VH1 and the Lower left-hand corner of the screen, they have a title and the artist and the album. We're going to put it on there just to make it look like a video. <clears throat> now, my friends, I want to go back to Patsy Schroeder for a moment because I want to try to finally put an end to all of this misunderstanding, all the problems I'm having with women. I tried... I've tried everything I know to prove that I'm not a pig, a piglet, a sexist, a chauvinist. I'm just an average guy. I happen to like stereotypical humor. Everybody's too tightly wound these days. Nobody. <laughs> you can't. You can't, we can't laugh at ourselves enough anymore. As you just witnessed, I have no trouble laughing at myself. <laughs> but I, by the same token, I mean, I have tried, I have asked women to send me photos. It was misunderstood. Do you know how it could have worked? If I would have said, I am looking for the girl of my dreams, then people say, oh, great bit. But I was being truthful. I'm trying to encourage female participation in a show. You put a doctor on, women will call all day and talk about their ills. Put a shrink on, they'll call all day. Put a dating expert on, they'll call all day. But issue shows they don't for some reason. And all I'm just trying to do is encourage that. And it was working. Then everybody started getting uptight and I said, I'm not here to cause trouble. I don't want to offend people. If it's going to offend people, I'll just stop doing it. 120 pounds of pictures. Incredible number. Now, to illustrate that I love women, I want to talk to you for a moment about women in combat. It's a major issue. Now, Patsy Schroeder again. Uh, uh, Patsy Schroeder thinks that women ought to be given the choice to go to combat a choice, something men don't even have. It's a great way to run the army. 
Hey, guys, we're planning an invasion of Panama. Anybody want to go? <laughs> hey, gals, going to Panama. Want to go have some fun? <laughs> B.T. Collins, who's a good friend of mine and who routinely makes fun of me, <laughs> has said this on more than one occasion, and it can't be said better. The purpose of armies is twofold to kill people and to break things. <laughs> An army is not the place for silly social concerns like quotas, affirmative action, and equal rights. Nobody likes armies. Nobody likes war. That's why people who fight them are called brave and courageous. And we should thank all of those who forever have fought war so that we might not have to, so that we might be here tonight. The purpose is to win, not to satisfy the current social climate in the mainstream of our society at whatever given moment. I don't think women should go to combat. It's bad enough when soldiers come home in body bags in great numbers. Why? Look at how upset we all are. Look at how our sensibilities have just been trashed with one rape in Central Park. It's got to imagine a whole war of that. We don't need to do that. It's not necessary, even if the women want to. This is not a comment on ability. It's not a comment on fitness or any of that. It's just, I think that this on my part represents a respect for women. But no, no, I somehow I'm depriving them of their rights. So, I am willing to compromise. I am willing to show, to go the extra mile, to prove to women that I am not rigid and that I can bend backwards. <laughs> so, I propose the All-American 1st Cavalry Amazon Battalion. <laughs> now, <laughs> you know, I should have looked up there when I was singing. Now, there are some things, ladies and gentlemen, we know about women. You may not like hearing this, but we know it. We know that women in groups, same office, same dormitory, same barracks, have eventually synchronized menstrual cycles. <laughs> For those of you in Rio Linda, again, that means at the same time. <laughs> we also know that there is this thing called PMS. And we know that it turns a woman into a hellion. It turns a woman into the most violent animal on earth. We know that PMS has been successfully used as defense against the charge of murder. Here is my proposal. We have 52 battalions. We, we can prepare. We can prepare a nation. That, so that we have, on any given week of the year, a combat-ready battalion of Amazons who go into battle. Now, imagine, imagine that you are Manuel Antonio Noriega. You are in the Papal Nuncio in Panama City. You feel safe. The only problem is that a bunch of Americans are playing Judas Priest music at a million decibels and you're thinking about committing suicide. That's your only problem. <laughs> All of a sudden, you hear this blood-curdling scream outside. <laughs> I am outraged by it! Outraged! And you look out there, and there is Sergeant Major Molly Yard. 
leading a battalion of Amazons on PMS over the hill. That would be enough to scare the pants off anybody. You would surrender at that given moment. The All-American First Cavalry, Amazon Battalion. Now that to me is compromise. <clears throat> you want to hear the gerbil story? You people haven't heard the gerbil story? Oh, gee. Uh, the gerbil story started. You really want to hear that? Okay, okay, in time. In time, I'll tell you. Gee. I want to talk, ladies and gentlemen, next about the environment. And I want to first treat you to some solid, undiluted, pure, concentrated logic. Without emotion, without human characteristics, just solid logic. And I would like to use this in a discussion on the spotted owl. Now, does it make sense? We are more concerned with saving owls than we are in many parts of this country with educating our children. We got people who are more concerned with ooh, ooh, saving owls. We have 2,200 pairs of owls, a grand total of 4,400 owls, and we're going to say we're not going to touch 3 million acres so that those owls will not be disturbed. Now, I don't know about you. Divide 4,400, well, I can live in pairs, 2,200 into 3 million acres. You have a living space per owl, probably 50 times larger than the Kennedy compound in Hyannisport. <laughs> in the meantime, a timber industry hangs in the balance. Now, you remember S. Brian Wilson? He gave his legs for peace, said the uh, Reverend Jackson. He laid down the tracks, the train didn't stop. <laughs> The <laughs> well, my friends, that's how it had to happen. It has had to. No way to be <clears throat> kind about that. Now, what in the world is S. Brian Wilson opposing munitions shipments to Nicaragua have to do with S. Brian Wilson in the redwood forest trying to save trees? You know, he's up there now giving them guidance on how to mount an effective protest camp. What do the two have in common? The only thing they have in common is they are opposed to the power structure in America today. That's all they have in common. And it proves that that's what their real goal is. These things are just little vehicles they're driving to get there. Well, I have a suggestion. Brian, the next time a lumber company comes into the forest with a big saw, strap yourself to the first tree you can find. And then, we'll call it arms for peace <laughs> and get even closer to the heart of the matter. Now, we got the spotted owl. I, I don't happen to believe it's a threatened species. But it doesn't matter because it's been named one, so we have to deal with that reality. Now, back to the pure uncondensed logic. Ask an environmentalist, they love us because they, they, it's another thing, they think that humanity is the enemy of nature. That everything is pristine and fine and clean and pure and man comes along and fouls everything up. Man's the problem. Then you say to one of these environmentalists, do you believe in evolution? Oh yeah, man. Yeah. Well, if, if you believe in, in evolution, you believe that human beings are part, oh, yeah, man, yeah, we used to be apes, man, yeah. Well, why are there still apes? Well, I don't know, man, I don't know, but we used to be. Everybody knows it. Okay, fine. Would you say that the human species has evolved to a position of superiority far above any other species? Well, man, let me think about that. Anyway, they don't admit that, but it's true. Anybody with any intellectual honesty at all has to admit that we have. We're the ones who can talk. They want to talk about how smart the dolphin is. 
It can't talk. There are people out there listening to it. Did you hear that? It's trying to communicate. It's, oh, it's wonderfully trying to communicate. All because it has a, what looks like a smile on its face. Oh, it must have a brain. There's no world animal in the world that can smile. It doesn't exist unless you have an operation on it. Now, then I asked the environmentalist, well, <clears throat> would you say that the owl has evolved to a superior position over the mouse? Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, the owl can fly. See at night, man. Precisely. The owl can at night swoop down, <laughs> gobble up that mouse. Mouse never knew. You can see it on the animal shows. That's all they are anymore, animals eating each other. A mouse gets eaten by an owl, head first, little legs dangling, and you go, oh, God, why am I watching this? You know how wonderful nature is? They don't even cook their food. At least we do that. <laughs> so then I say to the environmentalist, well, then, is it not the responsibility of the mouse to adapt to the potential threat of the owl? Oh, yeah, man, yeah, but that's, that's nature, that's nature. Well then, if the owl cannot adapt to our superiority, screw it. <laughs> now that's heartless. That has no emotion. But it's the, it's the simple, pure, logical explanation. If, they, if an owl can't adapt, who says the earth needs an owl? So it doesn't kill as many mice. Fine, we'll just build more traps. Either that or breed more cats, I don't know. <laughs> but we are human beings and we care. And so we have as a responsibility to be humane to those who are less developed than we are. And I think we should be. There's no reason why it has to be the owl or us. Why can't it be both of us living together Germany. There's no reason we have to put the timber business out of business just because of 2,200 pairs of owls. But yet people think that's progress. 30,000 jobs might be lost. That's progress. We're saving the owl. Wrong set of priorities. The Earth is in this thing called the universe. The, we humans define the universe to be everything that is. But I still think that the universe has to be somewhere. I think about this all the time. Even though the universe is everything, it is still somewhere. Where is it? And if you were outside the universe, which I firmly believe you can do, where would you be? Real Linda? <laughs> you, you, but you could do it. Now, <clears throat> now follow me on this. Here is this little planet. How long has the universe been around? We don't know. How big is it? We don't know. All we know is we can't comprehend its size. The human mind is incapable of comprehending how big this whole thing is. We do not know how long the Earth has been here. They found a 40, what, 40 million year old skeleton the other day of a dinosaur. 40 million years. Probably waiting on his luggage some airport. <laughs> 40 million years. And scientists, oh, don't you love them, scientists. Yeah, we know what happened to the dinosaurs. Meteorite struck. Nuclear winter-like con conditions. Nuclear winter with a meteor? We don't, even have, we don't even know what nuclear winter is. We can't even come to an agreement about that. We got people positing the ridiculous idea that they know what wiped out the dinosaurs 40 million years ago. We don't know beans about it. We only take educated guesses. We have Dr. Sagan. I loved it when he said this. He was making a speech to a bunch of people at a hotel in Washington. I watched it on C-SPAN. And they got a picture of Voyager from Voyager, three billion miles outside the solar system. By the way, is it concern you? It seems the only piece of space equipment we have that works is three billion miles away <laughs> and something on the ground we can't make work. 
this thing's three billion and we can tell it to take a picture? And it does. And in this picture, all the planets are aligned, and there's Earth. This little bitty speck, you can barely see it. And in the scope of the size of the universe, the Earth, irrelevant, minuscule. Now you come to this Earth, and the conditions necessary for life occur within 11 or 12 miles. My point with all this is, there are forces exerted on this planet, and have been exerted on this planet, for hundreds of millions of years. And somehow the Earth still provides conditions for life and a better life. And yet the environmental crowd would like to tell us that the last 40 years of human existence is about to destroy it all. Who do we think we are? We don't have the ability to destroy the planet. We could drop every nuke we have. We might make it tough for anybody but cockroaches to live, but we can't destroy the planet. Other news here. Uh, hey. Ted Turner. Ted Turner uh, 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 announced a fall schedule on TBS. Mm -hmm. Ted What's Turner. On it? Well, he's going to have an environmental news magazine called Network Earth, premiering August 12th. William Shatner interacts with a computer voiced by Faye Dunaway, that embodies the Earth's spirit and is critical of humankind. What have I always told you? We are the <laughs> enemies of nature. We're not part of nature. We're the enemies of nature. And then, of course, Captain Planet and the Planeteers, a cartoon anti-pollution series. Premieres in mid-September in syndication on Saturday mornings. Also air in 70 to 80 other countries. Tom Cruise was going to be the voice of Captain Planeteer. Mm -hmm. Captain Planet and then bowed out. Don't know why. He's too busy. My guess is he probably couldn't read the script. And I, I'm, I'm alarmed at this because, hey, I mean, you have Tom Cruise, who knows next to nothing about anything, <laughs> showing up at Earth Day in Washington. There's 700,000 people out there, and they're just there to have a good time. They're throwing Frisbees and flying kites and all that. And there's Cruise talking about, and we must start recycling, and we must stop this, and U.S. corporations must stop this, and da 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 He just finishes filming a movie, 35 cars in a stock car movie, gasoline burned and wasted. So he says, Tom, how can you say what you're saying? You just finished the movie, 35... It was only 35 cars, don't criticize me. 35 cars, Tom! Most people never own 35 cars in their life. You just used 35 cars for six months in a movie, and you're telling other people they're polluting the planet? Shut up, sir! Another example of hypocrisy. Here is another example. Paul Ehrlich, down the road, Stanford University, wrote a book, I think 19, ah, oh, whatever it was, early 70s, Population Bomb. Everything he predicted didn't come true. Wrong as it could be, but because it warned of the appropriate fears and doomed destinies, everybody embraced it. See, if this happens, we're in trouble. Well, he's now come out with another book to mask the inaccuracies of the first, and it's just as bad. Typical message. The average American baby will pollute the planet 1,000 times more than the average Ethiopian baby. Oh. So let's all pack up our kids and move to Ethiopia and raise them. What is the point of that? The point of that is, again, to portray American free enterprise system as evil. When the American free enterprise system, this is what amazes me, all these people trying to trash our free enterprise system and all the people who have lived in tyranny and oppression for the last 50 years striving to become what some of us are trying to tear down. We should listen to them and not listen to those in this country who, because they can't fit in with it and because they can't make a... All they can do to earn money is write books predicting doom based on fraudulent false information. The getting out in the real world is something that they just can't do and make money. We gotta stop listening to them. You really wanna hear the gerbil story? May I see a show of hands? How many have not heard this? You're kidding. <laughs> In 
Now, <laughs> I'll do it, but just remember, you asked for it. I must tell you where I discovered it. I read a publication called uh, American Spectator. And, and in the, the front of each issue, it's a monthly, is this column called A Continuing Crisis. And it's written by Emmett Tyrrell. And I was reading it one day. It's, it's, a, it's a column which chronicles all the odd, weird things that have happened since the last column. Some of it's funny as it can be. And I'm reading in there. It's where, it's where I discovered No Cirque. You know what No Cirque is? National Organization Circumcision Information Resource Centers. It's, it's in Corte Madeira. It's in the Bay Area. There's a group of people that got a videotape and a pamphlet they'll let you see. You imagine having that at your next party? Now, here's a group of people whose mission in life is to stamp out circumcision. Wipe out. Uh, uh, end it. Now, the, the director of this thing has to be somebody named Courtney or Fortney or, or something like that. Can you imagine what little Fortney's 10 years old? Fortney, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, I, I want to rid the world of circumcision. It's absolutely unnecessary. I want to get... You're at a cocktail party. Nice people you meet there. Hi, uh, who are you? My name is Courtney Schmortney. Oh, well, what do you do, Mr. Schmortney? I am in charge of No Cirque. Oh, No Cirque? National Organization of Circumcision Information Resources. What are you trying to do? Rid the world of circumcision. Hi, ah, nice to meet you. <laughs> now, not too many people have heard of them. I, when I did, made a suggestion. All good social causes need a song, and they all need a good singer to sing the song. John Denver, save the foreskin to the tune of Calypso, that they reject it. Now, I also wonder, how, how does somebody in No Cirque get paid? Tips? <laughs> Certainly not. <laughs> so I was reading the continuing crisis. And then came this wonderful sentence. The latest craze among progressive homosexuals has resulted in numerous gay men reporting to hospital emergency rooms needing gerbils surgically removed from their rectums. Oh, God! May I take you back to frog licking? Stop and think of that. Pick up a frog, lick it. Gerbil, my friends, a gerbil. Uh, I, now, I wanted this to be true desperately because I had the gerbil update theme picked out. I wanted it, but I'm not irresponsible. If it wasn't true, I won't do it. So, I, I told you earlier I'm naive. I read this thing. I figure I'm the only one that reads it. So, I want to see a gerbil. I figure size is crucial. I know it's smaller than a rat, bigger than a mouse. So I go to Petland at Arden Fair. I'm doing television at the time, debating the diminutive mayor of Davis. Shall I say creaming the diminutive mayor of Davis every night? So I'm known. They know who I am. So I go traipsing in there. Young girl behind the counter says, oh, hi, uh, Mr. Limbaugh. How are you? I said, just fine. Look. Uh, you have any gerbils? <laughs> Not for one minute thinking. I'm, I'm sorry, we, 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 we don't sell them. Oh, no, my heart's sake. This can't be true. Why don't you sell them? Well, because they consider vermin. If they get away, they, they, they poison the environment, pollute it, and we just can't sell them. Oh. So I walked out of there depressed. If you can't buy them anywhere in California, how can this be true? Not for one minute thinking she's telling everybody in the store, my God, Rush Limbaugh was just in here and wanted a gerbo. <laughs> so the next thing I decided to do was call my doctor. I was going to a doctor at a time, an ear, nose, and throat guy. 
I called him up. I said, look, I want to bring something by. Have you read it? I don't want to tell you what it says. You tell me if it's true. I took it by. He read it. Yep, it's true. <laughs> Everything about this is true, he said. I said, how widespread is this? He said, this is pretty common. He says, it's big in Seattle, big in, uh, big in fact, Rush in Philadelphia, television anchor guy got fired for telling a joke in the air. So what was that? What happens when a gay man walks into a pet store? I don't know. Gerbils all start barking. They want to think they're dogs. He told me everything about it. It's sick. It's absolutely, it, it, and I'm not going to share it with you. Don't worry about it, but it's absolutely sick. So I said, all right, if it's true, I'm going to do it. So the gerbil update theme was born. Help by the Beatles speed it up to chipmunk speed. <laughs> help me get my feet back on the ground. Won't you please, please help me? People started making gerbil totes and bringing them by. You remember that? I mean, there was a card. The late, not the late, the former. Great Senator Joseph Montoya. And an aide came running into my office one day, at KFBK. I gotta see Rush Limbaugh, I gotta see Rush Limbaugh. He was waving some greeting card. Brought it back. On the front cover it said, now the card that dares to ask the question. And you open it up and said, how many gerbils can you fit in your underwear? <laughs> so it was, it was a true story. And, and, and this went on for you know, a couple of times. I don't do it on the national show because I don't know if it still happens. This was at 86. And it has never been denied by anybody, but he said this was safe sex. Doctor did. Safe sex? <laughs> Putting a gerbil in your rectum is safe sex. <laughs> Look, folks, you know something? This has been a remarkable trip in for me. I, 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 I relate this every time I come back, and I, and I mean it more and more each time I do. Uh, to see this many people packed into this place and to have it sell as fast as it did and to come back here and be treated as nicely as I am, it makes me want to come back and live here, but, but, no, 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 no. But, no, I'll tell you, I, I will always have a, a special spot in, uh, in my heart. You, you all are more responsible for my success than, than you'll ever know. And I appreciate it, and thank you so much for it. Thank you for coming out. It has been a great evening, a great time. Thanks again to Clarence Frogman Henry and the rest of the group. You've been wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. period of solemn thinking uh, to honor the memory of the great Mitch Snyder. And I will do my mass. Ain't got no home. And then, boom, boom, boom. Ain't got no ho, ho, home. Boom, boom. Ain't got no home. Boom, boom, boom. Nowhere to roam. And the whole thing starts, curtain comes up, and the song is on. Audience will be on their feet. Now, I'm doing it a lot faster. I mean, let me give you just, here is how this thing will really go. Hey.